Hi guys. So we are going to talk about the second part of chapter 16, which is immunity. Now immunity is a little more involved than lymphatics. So this is going to be a little bit longer. But the first thing you need to know is that a pathogen is a disease causing agent. So anything that causes a disease is a pathogen. It can be a bacteria, a virus, or even a protozoan or a fungus. The presence and multiplication of the pathogen in the body, if we don't take care of it, can cause an infection. The body can actually prevent entry of pathogens or destroy them using our various defense mechanisms, and this is what involves immunity. So remember, the lymphatic system helps us with immunity because it's going to filter the lymph and anything that happens to fall out of the blood, it's going to catch and put back in. But in general, we have two types of immunity. We have innate immunity, which is basically what we're born with. And then we have adaptive immunity, which is what we get as we get older. So our innate or nonspecific defenses are very general, but they protect against a lot of different types of pathogens. On the other hand, our adaptive defenses are very specific. Now this is what's known technically and officially as immunity. Now this is more specific and precise and it's going to target specific antigens. It's carried out by lymphocytes that recognize those foreign molecules and destroy them. Now this is a chart showing you the types of innate or nonspecific defenses, but we're gonna go through each one of these now. So species resistance refers to the fact that certain species are going to be resistant to diseases that affect another species. So there's a lot of viruses out there, for example, that might infect one species but aren't going to jump over and infect another species. Certain species do not have the appropriate temperature or chemical environment for a particular pathogen to survive and proliferate, so they're not going to get infected by it. Mechanical barriers like our skin and mucous membranes, these are going to prevent entry of pathogens. So this is considered to be our first line of defense. All of the other nonspecific defenses are what we call our second line of defense. And our, our adaptive defenses are our third line of defense. So the first line of defense we have is our skin, of course. As the epidermis sloughs off, which we know it sloughs off on a daily basis, it's going to remove any superficial bacteria. We have ciliated epithelium in our respiratory tract that can trap and sweep away any pathogen. We have hair that's going to trap pathogens. And then tears, saliva, and urine can actually wash away a lot of microorganisms as well. Chemical barriers are chemicals, of course. So enzymes and body fluids are going to provide a chemical barrier. For example, pepsin and gastric juice and lysozyme in our tears will destroy microorganisms. Interferons interfere with viral replication. So remember that, interferons interfere. So they block viral replication and basically they help in the growth, of, in the stoppage of the growth of tumors and stimulate phagocytosis. So they're going to stimulate engulfing bad stuff. Defensins are peptides produced by neutrophils and other granulocytes that cripple microbes because basically they poke holes in their openings. They poke holes in the cell membranes or their walls. Collectins are proteins that protect against a lot of different bacteria, viruses, and yeast. Complement is a group of proteins in the plasma and other body fluids that is going to stimulate inflammation, attract phagocytes, and enhance phagocytosis. And basically, since it's a group of proteins, hopefully you can figure out that it's going to be a cascade of events that happens. So one is going to initiate the next step, which will initiate the next step. Natural killer cells are actually lymphocytes, but they're very different from B cells and T cells. Natural killer cells are a smaller population, and they basically provide immune surveillance. They're going to constantly be roaming around our body to defend against any viruses or cancer cells. 
and they'll secrete what's called perforin. And perforin perforates the cell membranes on the virus or cancer cell. So since it's perforating it, it's poking holes in it basically, kind of like the other one, and it's going to make the cell lice. It can also enhance inflammation. Inflammation, the four cardinal signs of inflammation, redness, swelling, heat, and pain. It's a process that basically walls off the infection site to inhibit the spread of the infection. And there's a chart that shows you the action and what the result is. Phagocytosis removes foreign particles from the lymph. Phagocytes in the blood vessels and tissues of the spleen, liver, or bone marrow are going to remove particles from the blood. The most active phagocytic cells are neutrophils and monocytes. Basically what happens when a tissue is damaged, it releases chemicals that's going to attract the phagocytes to the injury, and that's called chemotaxis. Monocytes that leave the blood will become macrophages, and they can either be free roaming around our body or fixed in certain tissues. Mononuclear phagocytic system consists of monocytes and macrophages of the body. And then fever. A fever begins when a viral or bacterial infection stimulates lymphocytes to proliferate. That's going to produce cells that secrete a substance called interleukin-1, which raises our thermal regulatory set point. Interleukin-1 is also called an endogenous pyrogene, which is basically a fire maker from within. The elevated body temperature indirectly inhibits microbial growth because a lot of microbes do not like higher temperatures. It also causes the liver and the spleen to take up iron, making it unavailable for the bacteria and fungi to use in their metabolism. So without iron available and at a higher temperature, they're not going to be as efficient as they would have been. High body temperature also increases phagocytic activity. The third line of defense, as I said earlier, is going to be our adaptive or specific defenses. This is resistance to a particular pathogen or to the toxin or metabolic byproduct that they produce. It's going to be based on the ability to distinguish our molecules that are self from non-self. So if we cannot figure out that a cell is foreign, we're not going to be able to fight it. Antigens are what allow us to do that. Antigens are basically surface proteins. Now we have self antigens like on our blood type that we talked about before, but then we can recognize foreign antigens or non-self molecules, and these are going to elicit an immune response. Adaptive responses are carried out by lymphocytes and macrophages, and there's two different types. The cellular immune response, which is performed by immune cells, and the humoral immune response, which is performed by antibodies. So the pathogen enters the body. If it gets past the first line of defense, which is our mechanical barrier, so our skin, then it's going to enter the body and have to deal with the second line of defense, which are natural killer cells, inflammation, fever, chemical barriers, or the third line of defense, which is cellular or humoral immunity. Antigens, again, are receptors on the surface of lymphocytes that enable our cells to recognize non-cell cells. They can be proteins, polysaccharides, glycoproteins, glycolipids, but the most effective antigens are large, complex molecules. Heptins are smaller molecules that are not antigenic by themselves, but they can combine with a larger molecule and then evoke an immune response. Lymphocytes are produced throughout our life, starting during fetal development. The red bone marrow releases unspecialized lymphocyte precursors into the blood. Half of those cells then settle in the thymus, specialize, and then are released. The other half are differentiated in the red bone marrow and then are released. So T cells specialize in the thymus. After release from the thymus, these are actually 70 to 80 percent of our circulating lymphocytes. Some of the T cells settle down in lymphatic organs, such as our lymph nodes or the white pulp of the spleen. 
B cells or B lymphocytes are released from the bone marrow. These are the other 20 to 30 percent of lymphocytes in the blood. They're abundant in lymph nodes, the spleen, the bone marrow, and the intestine. So just remember T cells come from the thymus, B cells come from the bone marrow. And this is just a picture showing you how they will mature in the thymus, T cells will then be released or B cells mature in the bone marrow and then are released. And that's a lymph node that they're both going to. Here's a chart comparing T cells versus B cells. As I said, T cells will mature in the thymus, B cells mature in the bone marrow. Keep in mind, they both originally come from the bone marrow and then the primary locations and their functions. A lymphocyte has to be activated before it can respond to an antigen. T cell activation requires the antigenic fragments to be attached to what's called an antigen presenting cell or an APC. Now this can be a macrophage, a B cell, or there's a lot of other different types. The antigen presenting cell is going to phagocytize the antigen, digest it, and then display its fragments on its own cell membrane bound to the protein that is part of the major histocompatibility complex or the human leukocyte antigens. When specific T cells encounter an antigen presenting cell displaying those antigenic fragments bound to the MHC proteins, now it can finally recognize the antigen is foreign. Once the T cell is activated, it will carry out its cell-mediated immune response. The T cell can secrete polypeptides called cytokines, which will enhance cellular responses to antigens. And there's specialized T cells. We have help helper T cells, cytotoxic T cells, and memory T cells. Helper T cells do exactly as the name implies. They help. So they activate other cells. They also help B cells produce antibodies. HIV targets helper T cells, which is why it's such an effective virus, and we'll talk more about that later. Cytotoxic T cells directly attack any cells that are cancerous or infected by a virus. And then memory T cells are created to provide future immune protection. So cytotoxic T cells will directly attack and kill other cells. Remember that because it's going to be a comparison to B cells. So here's some types of cytokines that can be produced and the function. Now B cells can be activated when the antigen fits the shape of their receptor and binds to it. Further B cell activation requires cytokines from the T cells. But once the proper cytokines are released from the helper T cells, B cells will respond by proliferating and enlarging a clone of identical cells. Some new B cells will become memory B cells to provide future immunity. Other new B cells differentiate into plasma cells, which produce and secrete large globular proteins called antibodies or also called immunoglobulins. Since antibodies are carried by the blood to the infection site, this type of response is called the humoral immune response or the antibody-mediated response. So both B cells and T cells require proper activation by helper T cells. Helper T cells will secrete the cytokines to activate them. That's why without the helper T cells, you don't have an immune response. B cell proliferation is going to produce dormant memory B cells that will then be able to respond the next time the antigen is encountered, and antibody secreting plasma cells that respond this time the antibody is encountered, or antigen, sorry. So this compares B cell with T cells. So in a nutshell, T cells are going to be released by red bone marrow, settle in the thymus, mature in the thymus, and then be released, and they can directly attack the pathogen. B cells, on the other hand, are going to mature in the bone marrow, but they can't directly attack the pathogen. 
they are activated and will produce plasma cells, which will then produce antibody. Now that antibody basically just marks whatever the pathogen is for destruction by a T cell. So B cells do not actually kill anything. They differentiate into plasma cells to create antibody, and then the antibody is going to mark it. Like if you've ever seen a forest when they're going to cut down certain trees and they mark the trees with an X, it's the same thing that B cells can do. B cells create the antibody that's going to mark the pathogen for destruction. But then a T cell is going to come in and actually destroy it. Now, antibodies themselves are proteins. They make up the gamma globulin fraction of the plasma proteins, which is, they're also called immunoglobulins. Now, the picture shows you it's kind of shaped like a Y, and there's constant regions and variable regions. Now, the constant regions are going to be the same with every type of antibody that we have. It's those variable regions that are different. And the variable region is going to differ with each pathogen that's encountered. So each type of antibody is going to have its own unique amino acid sequence and shape that's going to make it specific for that antigen. There's five major types. IgG is the most popular one. 80% of our antibodies are IgG. IgA is next, then IgM, IgD, and last IgE. Now make sure you know IgA is in breast milk. So that's how when we feed our infants breast milk, that's how they get some immunity from us. And IgE is what's released in an allergic response. So antibodies react to antigens in three different ways. They can attack a pathogen, but it's going to be by agglutination where they're going to clump together or the antigen will become insoluble or lose its toxic properties through neutralization. Antibodies can also activate complement, which remember complement was that cascade of events that we talked about earlier. And then finally, it can create inflammation to help prevent that spread of infection. But basically it's going to, like I said earlier, mark the pathogen for destruction by a T cell. Immunotherapy makes use of our immune system to fight disease. So we can use antibodies and cytokines. Monoclonal antibodies are specific B cells that produce a single type of antibody. And those can be fused with cancerous cells to produce a cell that produces one type of antibody and then keeps dividing. Monoclonal antibodies are often used in research, pregnancy tests, or to figure out if cancer has returned. Cytokines can be produced in large quantities because we have recombinant DNA techniques and the monoclonal antibody techniques. And these are going to be used to treat leukemia, hepatitis, genital warts, kidney cancer, all sorts of things. There's two different responses we have to exposure to an antigen. The first time we're exposed and then every time after that. The primary immune response is produced by the first encounter with the antigens. The antibodies are going to appear in five to ten days and then stay there for several weeks. Memory B cells will also be produced. When we are re-exposed to the same antigen, that is our secondary immune response that kicks in. Antibodies will be there in one to two days, which is a lot quicker. And they'll stay there for months or years. Some memory B cells can actually live for many years to protect you against re-exposure. We can also classify immunity based on if it is active or passive and naturally or artificially acquired. Naturally acquired means that it's obtained by a natural process. So you get disease, you get the disease and recover from it, or from the mother to the fetus or infant. Artificially acquired means it's obtained by an ejection, so something other than a natural process. Passive immunity means you have temporary immunity because you have antibodies. You haven't had antigen exposure, so you haven't had an immune response yet. 
think about it as if you're being passive, you're not really doing anything, you're not really working. And it's the same thing with our immune system. Passive immunity, our immune system isn't really working in there. We just have antibodies. Active immunity is permanent immunity obtained because you have actively come in contact with that antigen. Your immune system is working and memory B cells are produced. So when you put that all together, you've got the chart up top there. Naturally acquired active immunity is when you have exposure to the pathogens, so you actually develop the disease. Artificially acquired active immunity is when you've had exposure to a vaccine that has a weakened or dead pathogen or their components. So when you get the uh, measles, mumps, and rubella vaccine when you're an infant, or now talking about the COVID vaccine, that would be artificially acquired active immunity. Naturally acquired passive immunity is when the antibodies are passed to the fetus from a pregnant woman with active immunity or to a newborn from breast milk, for example. Artificially acquired, active, artificially acquired passive immunity is when you get the injection of the specific antibodies or antitoxin. And then you can see the results there as well. Hypersensitivity is result when you have an exaggerated immune response to something that isn't completely harmful. There's four different types, type one, two, three, and four, so as they are named. It happens when you are pre-sensitized to a certain antigen. Some of them can affect almost everyone. Some can affect only people that have an inherited ability to have that exaggerated immune response. And we're going to talk about all four. So the type one hypersensitivity is what we would call allergies. This is an immediate reaction. You produce a lot of the IgE antibodies against a specific allergen. It occurs shortly after contact with the allergen and histamine is gonna be released. Sometimes you could have hives, hay fever, asthma. Very horribly, it could lead to anaphylactic shock, which is the severe form. Anaphylactic shock usually results from bee stings or bug bites, something that goes directly into your blood. But your throat will swell up, your tongue swells, you have trouble breathing. My son is actually allergic to any kind of bug bite. If he gets bit, he swells up like a baseball wherever he got bit. And one time he was stung by four different bees in his neck and of course started going into anaphylactic shock, but I had his EpiPen, so jammed it in his thigh and drove him to the hospital. And he's fine, don't worry. And he's 20 years old. Type two hypersensitivity is the antibody dependent and cytotoxic reaction. So this is a blood transfusion mismatch. Antigens are gonna bind to the specific cell causing phagocytosis, complement will lyse the antigen, so this is when you're going to have, if you're type A and you get a type B transfusion, your body's basically going to attack that type B blood. Type 3 is the immune complex reaction. The antigen antibody complexes start to deposit in certain tissues. Rheumatoid arthritis is a good example of this. For some reason, they deposit and you can't get rid of those complexes, so they just sit there. And then type four is the delayed reaction hypersensitivity. This results from repeated exposure of the skin to the allergen. So poison ivy, for example, is an ex poison ivy, for example. It takes about 48 hours to occur, but what happens is the allergen activates the T cells in our skin, and then it releases the chemicals that cause the inflammation. This is just showing you the allergies, basically. Transplantation and tissue rejection is a rough thing to deal with. Tissues and organs that can be transplanted, there's a lot, kidney, liver, heart, bone marrow, for just to name a few. But if the donor's tissues are recognized as foreign, you will have a tissue rejection reaction. Basically, the recipient's immune system will try to destroy the tissue. 
So that's one reason why if you or somebody else needs an organ transplant, you have to be very carefully matched. Basically, what will happen if you have a rejection reaction is it's going to resemble a normal immune response. So it's highly important to match those MHC antigens because the greater the difference, the stronger and faster the reaction will be, the rejection will be. My brother has had two kidney transplants and one of my friends, April, actually donated a kidney to him and they matched only two out of six of the antigens. However, our immunosuppressive drugs are that good now that he's still going strong with her kidney and it's been 15 years now. So immunosuppressive drugs are basically drugs that suppress the immune system and those are used to prevent rejection. The problem is that you're suppressing the immune system. So you have to be very careful around other people, especially if they're sick in any way, shape or form. You also have to be careful with what you take and you basically will have to be on these drugs the rest of your life. These are the different types of transplants. Isografts are between identical twins and autografts are between you, you and yourself. So you have a skin, craft, a skin graft from one part of your body to another if you're burned or something like that. Now, isografts and autografts do not cause rejections because it is from your own body, your own DNA, or your identical twin's DNA, so there's no problems there. It's allografts and xenografts that cause rejections. Allografts are transplants between the same species, so like my brother and my friend April, they were an allograft. A xenograft is different species, so if you get the heart valves from a pig, for example. Autoimmunity, auto is self, so it's when your immune system attacks itself. It fails to make that distinction between self and non-self and produces autoantibodies. Cytotoxic T cells are going to attack the body's tissues and organs. Various autoimmune disorders affect different types of cells, and there are several theories about autoimmune disorders, but we can't quite pinpoint the cause just yet. This is a list of some of the autoimmune disorders, their symptoms, and what's happening with the antibodies. Through the lifespan, we've talked about many changes with every chapter pretty much. And just like everything else, our immune system function starts to decline. Our immune system starts to decline actually when our thymus shrinks. So at puberty, it's only about 25% as powerful as it was when you're an adult. You have a higher risk of infection and cancer as you get older because of this. Our T cell numbers go down a little bit. B cell numbers don't really change, but their activity level goes down. Antibody response to antigens is slower. Your IgA and IgG antibodies increase while your IgM and IgE antibodies decrease. So oftentimes elderly individuals are not candidates for certain medical treatments that suppress immunity or transplants where they might have to take immunosuppressant drugs for the rest of their lives because their immune system is already being hurt. HIV, human immunodeficiency virus, I mentioned it a little bit earlier, basically is a virus that breaks down your immune system. It can stay silent for years and then progress to AIDS. And that's not what really kills you. It's an opportunistic infection that will. As I said, HIV attacks macrophages and then helper T cells. When your helper T cell numbers decline, you do not have an immune response. Helper T cells activate both B cells and T cells. So if your helper T cell numbers are down, your B cells cannot produce antibodies because it doesn't have enough cytokines. Later on, HIV variants are going to affect those cytotoxic T cells that you have roaming around. So they're not going to be able to do anything. So a person is going to die from the loss of the immune response, basically. It's not necessarily the HIV or AIDS that kills them itself. It's because they don't have an immune reaction that's going to do it. 
It can be transmitted sexually, contaminated needles, birth or milk from an infected mother, or if you get infected blood or tissues from a donor. The big thing with HIV is because it can stay dormant for so long, oftentimes it might not be detected for a while. However, our cocktail of drugs that we give HIV patients has improved so significantly over the last few years that now, if with the right cocktail of drugs, HIV individuals can get to non-detectable levels, which means that we can not detect the HIV virus in their blood. So that's just awesome. So we are coming very far with medicine and medical procedures these days. So that is it for immunity. So I will see you with the next chapter. I hope this helped. Bye. You know what? Let me sum up real quick. So T cells, we have cytotoxic T cells, which will directly kill foreign cells. We have helper T cells that activate B cells and T cells. And then we have memory T cells, which will help if there's a reinfection of something. We also have something I didn't mention called suppressor T cells, which suppress a tumor formation, which is also a good thing. Then we have B cells, which B cells can indirectly attack foreign invaders doing inflammation and things like that, but they will always mark a pathogen for destruction by a cytotoxic T cell. And then we have natural killer cells that perform immune surveillance and are always roaming around our body looking for foreign antigens. Now, that is it. I will see you in the next chapter. Bye.